Philip, now Lord Hammond, was the Chancellor of the Exchequer under Theresa May between 2016 and 2019, and he joins us now. Good morning. Thanks very much for being with us. Um, just before we get to the budget, I'm quite interested to hear your views on the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. How concerned should we be? Well, look, it's not going to affect many individuals in the UK because not many people bank with Silicon Valley Bank, but it is going to affect the very important fintech sector in our economy where there's a huge concentration around Silicon Valley Bank UK. And there's a lot of small, early stage businesses that are quite important to this economy, quite important to keeping our financial services sector at the cutting edge, who will be very, very nervous today. So I hope that in the course of the day, the government, the Bank of England, Rothschilds, who are managing this process, can come up with a solution that allows those businesses to get access to their funds tomorrow morning and reassure their customers, their investors, because this is a very important dynamic sector and we don't want to see uh, it suffer a, a massive own goal here. I mean, the, those plans have been worked up as we speak. What kind of things do you think they should be looking at? I mean, should taxpayers' money be on the table? Well, I think what, whatever happens, the Bank of England is going to have to provide some significant additional liquidity to whoever buys um, SVB, and uh, I think that's the most likely outcome, that it will be liquidity sold... Liquidity means what, uh, money. Cash, yeah, money. Yeah. Because, as I understand it, SVB has good quality assets. It's not a question of the firm's bust. Mm. It's a question of it's unable to turn those assets into cash quickly. And the Bank of England can help there. The Bank of England can step in and loan it money, as it routinely does to banks, um, to allow them to pay their depositors, mm -hmm. um, settle the nerves of the market, and then unwind its assets in a more orderly fashion over a period of weeks or even months. Uh, thank you very much. That's interesting. Uh, now, we heard from the Chancellor earlier on the programme. Um, there's a lot of jitteriness among Conservatives about the level of tax uh, in the UK. Corporation tax, obviously, due to rise by 6%, and the Chancellor was pretty clear that he's going to stick with that. Do you think that's the right decision? I think it's the right decision for now. Mm -hmm. um, I, of course, as I've said before, lower corporation tax is always better than higher corporation tax for economic growth. Um, but the thing that uh, really matters to businesses is the effective rate of taxation. And I expect we're going to hear the Chancellor um, making some moves on allowances and reliefs so that for many businesses, particularly those that are investing heavily, mm. um, the effective rate of corporation tax is lowered a bit. But I think what business will be looking for is, first of all, a signal from Jeremy Hunt that in the medium to long term, he does want to see corporation tax lower, that he doesn't see 25% as some new normal. That's a, a tax for a moment in time. And secondly, they're going to want to see that, apart from tax, the government recognises and is tackling the challenges of economic growth. Mm. There are many problems facing this economy at the moment. And if business sees the government um, moving to deal with those problems, it'll be a little bit less concerned about the higher rate of tax. How do you think they should be moving to deal with that? Well, I think there are th three big challenges for any Conservative um, Chancellor. The first is he's got to demonstrate fiscal responsibility. And especially given the circumstances in which Rishi Sunak came into office, I think they've done a great job in stabilising the markets, stabilising the perception of the UK's public finances. But the job is absolutely not done. Um, and we're still borrowing eye-wateringly large amounts of money. I've, I've read in the papers Jeremy Hunt might have 20 or £30 billion pounds of headroom. Mm -hmm. What that headroom really means is that he might have... He might be borrowing 20, 30 billion pounds less than we thought we would be borrowing. It's not real money. We're still it's in the red. Just, it's we're, we're massively in the red. So that job is not finished and he's got to show an iron resolution to complete that job. Secondly, he's got to continue the battle against inflation because it's inflation that's eroding people's living standards. But thirdly, and I think this is where we're going hopefully to see some strong signalling um, in the budget, um, he's got to set out a growth agenda so that when we get through this period of fiscal difficulty, when we get out of the period of high inflation, we've at least got something to look forward to, that the economy will return to growth. Because the forecasts at the moment are not very positive. Yes, the UK economy hasn't gone into a deep recession, but it is still way behind its peer group of international economies. Do you think a recession is likely? Um, if, if, if there is, it looks like it'll be a shallow um, recession. So we'll either hover just above or just below the line on recession. But the real problem here is looking out a year or two years 
What we're not seeing is uh, any signals that will return to strong economic growth. And we need um, something a bit more than an anemic sort of three quarters of a percent, one percent, one and a quarter percent. Mm -hmm. We need to find a way of getting this economy back to growing at two percent a year, year in, year out. That's the way we raise people's living standards. We Jeremy Hunt talked a lot about getting people back into the workplace, which is pretty hard, right? If you're left the workplace and you can afford to do so, it's quite difficult to get those people back in. I mean, there is an easier way to do this, right, to fill the vacancies, which would be to relax certain immigration rules. Should they be looking at that? So the problems in our economy are mainly on the supply side of the economy. It's not that there isn't demand. It's that there, isn't, there aren't the resources to meet that demand. Um, there, there isn't the land with planning permission to build the houses that people want or the factories that people want. There aren't the workers to fill the jobs um, that are available. So you're absolutely right. The, the, the most obvious way to deal particularly with the need for lower skilled workers would be to relax immigration rules. But of course, um, there is another political agenda out there which is very concerned about levels of immigration and this all gets mixed up with the, the Brexit uh, debate and the end of free movement. To be honest, so, do you basically think that the mo most sensible thing to do from a purely economic uh, perspective is to relax immigration rules, but it's the politics that's present preventing you from doing that? If I was the Chancellor and I was unconstrained, I would relax the immigration rules in a very specific and narrow way in that I would allow, I would issue a certain number of short-term work visas for people who would come here to do mainly lower skilled um, work with no right to remain, no rights of settlement, mm -hmm. come, stay three years, work and leave. Mm -hmm. um, Jeremy Hunt won't do that because of con political constraints. What he's going to do, I think, and the signalling is pretty clear, is focus on trying to get people who are already here into the workforce. So people who've retired early, mm -hmm. getting them back in, people who are thinking of retiring early, mm -hmm. deterring them from doing that, people who are out because of long-term health or mental health problems, helping them to get back into the workforce. And I think you'll see a mixture of carrots and sticks, mm -hmm. some generous childcare support, mm -hmm. some additional work training and support for people who want to get back into the workforce, coupled with a, a slightly tighter regime mm -hmm. for benefits for people who choose to stay out of the workforce for long periods. Um, I just want to zoom out for a minute. Mm. Um, the Conservative Party's polling is abysmal, right? Um, it's looking like it's a not very... Right. Yeah, that's one way of putting it. Um, what do you think the Conservative Party needs to do if you're going to have any chance of winning the next election? It feels to me like you're focusing an awful lot on red wall seats and perhaps not on the blue wall seats like the ones that you used to represent. Yeah. Well, I think, um, to be honest, Rishi Sunak's doing it. What needs to be done? The only thing he can do after a period of extreme turbulence is uh, demonstrate again to people that Conservative governments deliver fiscal stability, uh, get inflation down and promote sound money, and can deliver a growth agenda for the medium term. That's the bit that's missing at the moment. And the thing that I really want to see on Wednesday is a narrative that shows that, you know, problems with backbench Tory groups who um, don't like um, house building, for example, or who don't want closer relations with major trading partners like Europe, or who don't want to see relaxation of migration rules, can be overcome. The Tory party must go into the next election as the party of fiscal responsibility and economic growth. It can't win an election unless it is the champion of those two principles. You're talking about the need for close links with trading partners. Another yeah. of those trading partners is China. I was quite interested in the speech you made in February mm -hmm. uh, where you talked about the trading relationship and you said this. You said, uh, for all the noises we hear, many of our global partners have been yeah. quietly increasing their share of trade with China while we have seen our stagnate over the pandemic period. Time now to roll the sleeves up and get that market share climbing. Mm -hmm. So you think we should be doing more trade with China? Yes, I do. I think, um, um, and we have to be clear-eyed about China. This has always been my view on mm -hmm. China. China has a very different political system, very different culture, very different history from us, and we disagree profoundly with them on some important issues. But we disagree profoundly with a lot of people on important issues, and we still trade with them. China is our fourth biggest trading partner, our sixth biggest export market. We proclaim that the UK is a great global trading nation. We cannot simply turn our back 
on the world's second largest economy and our fourth largest trading partner. We have to engage with them and we have to be clear that simply because we're trading with someone doesn't mean we endorse their politics or their, uh, their political culture uh, in any way. Um, but we've got a long tradition in the UK of trade-led diplomacy. And I think if we build our trading links, um, we then work on the other issues that divide us. I mean, a lot of your colleagues would dis disagree with that, not oh, least because of you know, yeah. human rights abuses that we've seen uh, in Hong Kong, the treatment of the Uyghurs, reports in the Sunday Times today that the UK wants to see TikTok banned from all UK government electronic devices. Well, that's a, that's a specific security issue, and we need to look at that so that's on, on, its, on its merits. But we trade with lots of people um, where we, with whom we have human rights um, concerns. We have to be pragmatic about the fact that we're talking about the world's second largest mm -hmm. economy here. And somehow I think some of my colleagues have got a mindset that when we trade with somebody, we're doing them a favour. Believe me, it doesn't work like that. We need to trade. We are a trading nation. After Brexit, after Covid, after the uh, energy price crisis, we have a challenge in this country about how to deliver growth, how to earn our living so that we can maintain our public services, we can uh, improve people's standards of living in the future. And trade has to be a part of that. It's not a choice for us. We've got to get on and trade with the world. Now, before I let you go, I want to get your take on the Gary Lynn Corral. I, I quite like questions where I don't actually know what the answer is going to be. And with you and Gary Lindica and the BBC, I feel like I genuinely don't know what your view is on this, which is always quite a good position to start off with. What is your view? Is he entitled to express his beliefs or does it go against the impartiality of the BBC? So I think there's two things, and I'm not an expert in this area, yeah. but there's two things um, that struck me reading this debate. There's, we're in danger of confusing two separate issues. Um, there's the impartiality of the BBC, which is a very important principle, of course, for a public service broadcaster. And, and it's, I think, probably, by and large, the BBC usually gets it mostly right because, and I know that, because people in my party feel that the BBC is institutionally biased against it. And I know that people in the Labour Party equally feel that the BBC is institutionally biased against it. So it's probably doing something um, about right. Then there's a separate issue about whether individuals who are closely associated with large corporations can publicly express views which are highly controversial and are not the views of that corporation. And I think, generally speaking, that is not acceptable. It's even more important when the corporation is a public body, like the BBC or, indeed, the civil service. The same would be true of a senior civil servant tweeting out um, something that was highly controversial. But, look, it goes further than that. Um, if a senior executive of Sky um, were to tweet something highly controversial, they'd have a problem with their management. If a senior executive of one of Britain's major but banks... But it's also slightly... Do it. It's different as well because of the licence fee money as well, right? Yeah, of course, there's the public um, element. But if you talk to senior executives or senior figures across um, high-profile businesses in the UK, I think you'll find them all saying that they are extremely cautious about publicly expressing views unless that are controversial, unless they are clearly the views of the corporation they work for. Just very finally, is there a risk the BBC looks too close to the government right now, uh, that they've stepped in, uh, double-footed, if you like, a double-footed tackle on uh, Gary Lineker? We have the row over Richard Sharp not disclosing his involvement in facilitating a loan to Boris Johnson. Is it swinging too much? Well, look, it, this is the point, isn't it? it? No doubt there will be many people on the left of politics saying, look at this, this is another example of the BBC cozying up to the Tory party. I can tell you that the vast majority of uh, my former colleagues in the parliamentary Tory party see the BBC in a different light as, but the a, current as a champion BBC of the left of centre. It feels like the scrutiny is on their closeness to the Conservative party. And, That's it's, a fair... and, and it's right that there should be um, scrutiny on it. OK, thank you very much indeed, Lord thank Hammond. You.